Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us for our PM service. We look forward to having an incredible service tonight. Really quick, before we get started with our service, go ahead and share, comment, give us a thumbs up, tell us that you're here, and share this link with a family member or a friend to tell them that you're joining the Pentecostals of Bossier City here tonight. We look forward to an incredible service tonight. And again, thank you so much for joining us. If you are a guest joining us for the first time, if you would do me a favor, go ahead and follow that link below and get connected with us so our team member can connect with you and your family. Again, thank you so much for joining us for our PM service. We love everyone and we miss everyone and we look forward to the day to where we can come together again and worship collectively. We love you and let's have a great PM service. Greetings again, Bozier. Good to be with you. Thank you for having my wife and I. We love you very much. Love you, Bishop Dean, Sister Dean, Ryan. Love you, man. Thank you for having us again, and uh, pray the Lord blessed you uh, and the Lord touched you Sunday. Excited what the Lord is going to do tonight. Um, feel to talk to you um, out of the Book of Jude and the Book of Revelation. This is uh, something the Lord's been dropping in my spirit the last week and a half or so, and uh, I pray it. I pray it strengthens you and helps you in your fight with the enemy. The book of Jude's only one chapter, so we we'll read chapter one, verse eight through sixteen, and then we'll turn to one page and read Revelation chapter two, verses eighteen through twenty-one. The Bible said in the book of Jude, likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. <clears throat> Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they have, no, which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things, they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Now, let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 18 to 21. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith, and thy patience and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. She repented not. I want to talk to you from the subject confronting the four spirits of control. Confronting the four spirits of control. If I would subtitle this, I would subtitle it, Cain has friends. Cain has friends. Would you pray with me right now in your home, in your car, wherever you might be? Lord Jesus, speak tonight. I pray your word would go forth like a flame of fire. And I pray it would quench every attack of the enemy. And I pray tonight 
that your word would speak very clearly. Anoint my lips, anoint the people listening to me tonight in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen like you mean it. Praise God. Uh, at the end of the Bible, four people from the Old Testament, four wicked people, jump back in at the end of the Bible in the New Testament. Dead thousands of years, but yet somehow they make their way back at the end time. And in, in the last days they show up. You'll find these four people in the book of Jude and Revelation like we just read in our text. And these four people who did such evil things in their lifetime now attack the church in a spiritual form. And these four people are connected by the same spirit. Dare I say they are of the same spirit. Basically it's the same spirit with four different faces. And this spirit is the main spirit loose in our world, in our nation, and even in our churches. It is the spirit of control. The word control means the power to influence or direct people's behavior or course of events. It's strong in our nation right now. It's strong in our world. People's rights are being taken. All kind of crazy things. People being quarantined even though they're healthy. You're foolish if you think that's, that, that's all it's about. Stuff is going on behind the scenes for sure. And the spirit of control is definitely involved. The four faces of control. The first face is the face of Cain. Cain's name in the Old Testament means possession. In the New Testament, his name in the Greek, it, may, it means maker or fabricator. But in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, it means possession. So right off the bat, initially, you'll understand that one of the attributes of the spirit of control is materialism. Control wants stuff. Cain would rather have his stuff than have a relationship with you or with God. The spirit of Cain gets frustrated by the spirit of Abel. Cain hates when someone out worships him. And because Cain cannot get, cannot touch God or strike God, because truly Cain is mad at God for rejecting his worship, Cain then kills someone that represents God to him. And when people can't touch God, when they're mad at him, they go after the people who shut up, that represent God the most. That's why a spirit of Cain will usually go attack the pastor because the person's really mad at God, but since they cannot touch God, they go after the man of God. Boy, I'm preaching now. The spirit of Cain, Cain's a man that will not sacrifice. He will, he will give, but he will not sacrifice. Always pay attention to people who never join in on the church consecrations. Always pay attention to the people that are good people, but they're carnal. And they will never join in when pastor says, let's go to the mountaintop. Let's pray. Let's go on a fast. Let's do this. Let's go further. And they just have an excuse every time why they do not join in. It's the spirit of Cain that says, I like to connect but I do not like to consecrate. I like to be around the people of God, but I do not like to sacrifice what I'm supposed to sacrifice. Another attribute of the spirit of Cain is it converses before it kills. He talked to Abel in the field before he murdered him. In other words, he likes to talk to you before he takes you out. He speaks to you before he destroys you. He confronts you before he kills you. And he converses with the thing he plans on destroying. Be careful because the spirit of Cain wants to talk to you. But it also wants to kill you when the conversation is over. Cain refuses to take responsibility. Uh, am I my brother's keeper? The spirit of control never admits to being wrong. 
the spirit of control never admits that I did something wrong, that I am responsible, that I am that I am a sorry for what I've done. The spirit of control is never apologetic for what it's trying to dictate. And when Cain was, was confronted by God because Adam wouldn't confront him and Eve did not confront him, so God had to confront Cain back in Genesis. He, he, he erases Cain from the scene and Cain becomes a vagabond and God marks him and Cain walks the rest of his life as a vagabond, disappears from your Bible until the end of the New Testament, but when he comes back in the book of Jude, he does not come back alone. He comes back with friends. He comes back connected. The Bible talks about spirits when they leave a man. When a spirit leaves a man, it will go out and find seven other spirits stronger than itself and come back and see if that man's house is empty and clean. In other words, when the demons leave, they come back stronger to see if you're still serious. And Cain, he leaves the Bible alone, but he comes back connected and, and that the person that comes back with him initially is Balaam. Balaam followed Cain in that verse. It's, first it's Cain. First it's the jealous uh, face of control. It's, a, it's the, the attitude of anger. It's the, it's the materialistic. It's the connected but won't consecrate face of control. But, but then the second face of control is Balaam. Balaam comes back in your Bible three times at the end. 2 Peter 2.15, Jude 1.11, Revelation 2.14. Balaam, in your Bible, in the Old Testament, was a prophet. He was gifted by God. He could see things in the Spirit. The problem was he was not covered. Can I say this? Balaam saw Moses in God's people. And a king by the name of Balak, Balak hired Balaam to go to a mountaintop and to curse Israel. To keep them from coming through on their way to the promised land. Uh, Balaam had a real gift, but the problem was Balaam was unsubmitted because Balaam should have looked at that king and said, if that's Moses down there, I need a Moses in my life. Can I say it like this? The more gifted you are, the more covering you need. The greater your gifting, the greater your need for covering. And so Balaam said, I, I have this gift but I won't submit it to a Moses. See, Balaam has to be a superstar. He has to stand out. He has to be noticed in front of the people, even though there's only one shepherd. Balaam wants recognition. In fact, Balaam's name means not of the people. I'm gifted, but I'm not unified. I'm anointed, but I'm not loyal. I've got things that work, but I'm not connected to you. And it's a spirit that gets a hold of people that says, I, my gifting can keep me beyond where my covering can keep me. Be careful when hell lies to you and you begin to rely on your gifting rather than the words coming out of your pastor's mouth. Be careful when hell tells you that you, you can skip the service and you can watch it later and you can get around to it, but you never do because you've got other things more important and you're, you're doing things and you're ministering also. I don't even know who I'm talking to, but I'm talking to someone right now and that's spirit needs to go down in the name of Jesus. Another attribute about Balaam was 2 Peter 2.15 said that Balaam loved the wages of unrighteousness. In other words, he loved to be paid. In other words, Balaam could be bought. Balaam could be hired. Balaam could be uh, persuade, persuaded. Balaam could be swayed one way or the other. Balaam was not loyal because Balaam was looking for the highest bidder. And so had Moses come to him and said, curse Balak and we'll give you more money, he would have done that. You see, his gifting was based upon what he received from people. In other words, he released stuff but the source of the release was not God. It was who was hiring him. Mm. And so Balaam was a prophet for hire. 
And yet, even though he's got this gifting where he can bless and curse and he can do things, apparently he's blind in the spirit realm because he could not see an angel right in front of him that a donkey could see. His own donkey could see the angel, but Balaam could not see it. In other words, he's gifted, but he's not sensitive. Oh, the spirit of control is usually gifted, but never spiritually sent. It's talented, but it's not anointed. It's gifted, but it doesn't pray. And Balaam, he looked around. He couldn't curse what God had blessed. He told that king, I can't curse him. In fact, he went to mountaintop after mountaintop trying to curse him, and he couldn't do it. And it's funny because when I think of Moses, I think of mountaintops where Moses would climb and fast 40 days and go into the glory of God. When I think of Balaam, I think of him going to the mountaintop to curse people. Both Moses and Balaam had mountaintop experiences, but one used this mountaintop to curse people and one used this mountaintop to consecrate unto God. Oh, help me be like Moses to where if I'm going to climb a mountain, it's not to view what I can have or what I put power. I can release on people but let me find the glory of God and let me pursue it with all my heart soul and strength and their attribute of Balaam the Bible said in Revelation 2 14 that Balaam taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel <laughs> in other words he said I, I can't stop them but I know how to get them to stop you got to curse them from within they if they get sin in their group their God will stop them and uh, Balaam, he basically is saying, look, I, I know that my power doesn't work against them from without, but I know how to destroy people from within. The spirit of control works from the, I want you to write this down, the spirit of control works from the inside out. When control comes into a home, it works on a family member to destroy the family from the inside out. When it comes into a youth group, it comes on someone either on the staff or in the youth group to destroy from the inside out. When it comes into a church, it tries to destroy it from the inside out. Some attacks come from without, but the spirit of control always works from within. Mm. Sets up scenarios to trip you and to make you fall. Balaam uh, is removed by the sword. He died. They killed him. Didn't, his prophecies didn't work. But he's followed at the end of the Bible by another face of control. And we're getting more serious now because now it's Korah. And Korah's name means baldness. <laughs> to lose your covering. Korah's problem was he was unthankful. It's an unthink. There's another attribute of the spirit of control. It's never thankful for what it has. It's never grateful for what you do for it. Uh, someone that's got a spirit of control will never say thank you when you do something kind for them. They'll, they'll never be grateful for what you do because truly they're not after what you bless them. They're after what you have. They're not after what you gave them. They're after what you possess. And so Korah wanted to be Moses. He wanted to be the leader. He wanted to be recognized. He wanted to be noticed and popular. And he wanted to be looked up to and respected. So what he would do is he would talk about leadership behind its back. He would act one way in front of Moses and then another way when he was alone in his tent with the people. And very similar to Judas, he would question things Moses did. Judas questioned Jesus and Korah question Moses. And I'm going to give you a real strong point right now about the spirit of control. Uh, one of the greatest signals of the spirit of control is insecurity. And, here's, and here's, here's how it's proven in Korah's life. When Korah launched his revolt against Moses, he was not quite sure he was right. He wasn't quite sure. Something deep down convicted him. And so rather than go pray and say, God, am I wrong or am I right for my opinion of leadership? God, if I'm wrong, convict me. He didn't want to deal with that. And so when that voice of conviction whispered to him, he went and found a couple friends named Dathan and Abiram. 
And these guys were weak, and they, they just looked up to Korah because he had a name. He was related to Moses, and so they, they just basically agreed with everything he said. And the spirit of control loves to find people that will agree with everything it says. But he was so insecure that he could not revolt alone. <laughs> Shut up. He had to find someone to agree with him. Usually when people leave their pastor, they try to take somebody with them if they've got a spirit of control on them. Because deep down, I'm in the Holy Ghost and in the deep waters right now. Deep down, they know they're wrong. Deep down, there's a conviction that says you're, you're probably not doing the right thing. So to silence that, they find someone that will agree with them and then therefore strengthen their base or strengthen that mentality or strengthen that belief that they're listening to to give them the confidence to leave their pastor. Oh, somebody in that church ought to lift up your pastor right now and start praying for brother and sister Dean. Somebody start praying for Brother Ryan Dean. Somebody start praying for his wife and children. Somebody start praying for the Dean family right now. I feel the Holy Ghost on me right now. I want you to pray for your pastor right now. I want you to pray for your covering right now. And Moses told the people, he said, listen, get out of Chorus Tabernacle, which was his tent, his house. Get out of his house because Something bad's about to happen to Korah. Now watch this. He said, I know you're not even talking. You're just listening to him. But what he is saying is so evil, has so much poison, has so much venom that it can kill you by you just listening to it. When it comes out of the mouth of the spirit of Korah, it can get in your spirit and kill you without even you having any idea how it got in you. In other words, don't entertain conversations with Korah. Don't let Kothra Shatta. Don't let somebody walk up and start blasting your pastor. And because even though you may not agree, when you are silent, hell assumes that you are weak. And hell assumes that you can be run over and you can be persuaded to one day turn on your pastor if you listen to the voice of control. Even if you don't speak up, hell understands, hmm, they're not as strong as they act. That's why you must voice it and you must vocalize it. No, you're not talking about my pastor pastor to me and then if you turn the page over of course Korah dies a, a scary death he is swallowed the ground opens up and swallows him his family Dathan and Abiram and their families everybody gone in one moment because they tried to control the man of God and I'm sure I'm not preaching to anybody there I'm sure everybody is doing the right thing and uh, and but I just feel a revelation to give you the fourth face of control that must be confronted is the face of Jezebel. Jezebel's name means Baal exalts. In other words, a false god exalts me. Hmm. She's lifted up by false authority. In other words, she doesn't have the power she proclaims to have because the thing that gave her the quote-unquote power is not even real. She's a poser. She's a liar. She assumes and she tries to come off as a prophetess, tries to be more spiritual than everybody else around her, competes with spiritual authority, poses to have spiritual sensitivity when she does not, hates prophetic preachers teaches people to sin in Revelation and she was consumed by the world. In fact, her and Balaam in Revelation 2 both did the same thing. The Bible said they, they taught people and they ate things sacrificed unto idols. The people would take food and lay it before these false idols and then eat the food that they sacrificed to idols. It's a spirit of consumption. Control is a consuming spirit. It's never satisfied with the position, with the power, with the money, with whatever the, the 
the accolades. It wants more. It's controlling. If, if, this, if these people uh, are, are, are submitted to it, then, then they want these people because it's control. It's control. Must have more territory. Must have more people beneath me. Must have more people submitted to me. Must have more people looking up to me. I have to compete with people that are doing things because others look up to them. It's a controlling spirit. Jezebel hates holiness. Jezebel refuses to repent. Jezebel paints her face and masks herself as something that she's not. She poses as different things. It's disgusting. And yet somehow at the end she falls out of the window. She's thrown out of the window and God brings her down. Now I want to preach to you. All four faces of control have one thing in common. All four faces have one thing in common, and that is this. They all love to argue. The number one attribute of the spirit of control, it loves to argue. <laughs> what do you mean? I mean this. Cain argued with Abel, then killed him, then argued with God. Am I my brother's keeper? Um, Balaam argued with his donkey. When an angel was riding her. Korah argued with Moses and argued with the people that were submitted to Moses. And Jezebel argued with Elijah. The controlling spirits love to argue, and here's why. If the spirit of control is near your home or near your family, when control comes in, the only way to strip you of authority, because it's not as powerful as you are, is to bait you into a conversation where you step out of the spirit and into the flesh. And now you try to win an argument rather than cast it out. Can I preach it to you like I want to? The Lord said to me, if you're going to argue with the spirit of control, argue like an angel. I said, what do you mean? He took me back to Jude, verse number nine. Michael the archangel, when contending or fighting with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. He durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. In other words, Michael said, I'm not getting into an argument with the devil who's known for his voice. I'm going to step back and use the authority that I know I possess. He said, I submit, I'm submitted to the Lord. And I know the Bible also says, submit yourself unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And so Michael said, the Lord rebuke thee and when Michael said the Lord rebuke thee there was nothing the devil could do to fight back can I say this if you're going to speak against the spirit of control speak from the position of authority because if you get baited into arguments you will not win. You might win the argument, but the spirit will still stay in the house. But if you stay, shut up. If you stand up and say no more in the name of Jesus, that's not going to happen. And I command that spirit to leave in Jesus' name. What you are doing is you are taking authority over anything that hell tries to control you with. Oh, shut up. And when you speak like that, you're arguing like an angel would. If you're, if you're resisting the devil and he's not leaving, if you're, if, you're, if you're telling him to get out and he's mocking you, it's a submission problem. Because the Bible says submit and he'll leave when you resist him. So here's what you ought to start doing right now. I want you to start praying things like this. God, I submit myself to the word of God. I submit myself to the name of Jesus. I submit myself to the Holy Ghost inside of me. I submit myself to the blood of Jesus. I submit myself to the angels of the Lord. And ready? I submit myself to my pastor and my leadership. And if you'll start doing that every single morning, when the, oh, shut up, when the devil comes to attack you, either through a family member or through some kind of thing in your mind, all you have to do to cast that spirit out is say, the Lord rebuke you in Jesus' name. And when you do that, your submission will reach back and grab its authority and push that spirit out of your house.
Let me pray for you right now as I close and give this back to Bishop by the authority of the word of God and by the power that's in the name of Jesus. I command every spirit of control in every house, in every marriage, in every ministry, in every part of the departments of the church, wherever it's hiding, I come against it in Jesus' name. If it's seeing, I command to be blind, like Elisha blinded the enemies, blind the spirit of control. I pray you would make it deaf, that where it cannot hear commands from Satan, and it cannot speak orders and release things in people's homes and marriages, and I also command it to be mute. I command it to be dumb in the name of the Lord Jesus, like you did the lion's God. Shut the spirit of control's mouth in Jesus' name, so let it be released right now in your house in Jesus' name. Let angels release. Let angels go where the demons have been. Let there be peace where there's been pain. Let there be peace where there's been strife. Let there be peace where there's been arguments. Let there be faith where there's been fear. In Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you. Bishop, it's all yours. In Jesus' name.
Wow, that was an incredible service. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and taking your time to just join us in worship um, and hearing the Word of God. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We look forward to seeing you this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And you can tune in right where you're tuning in on YouTube or Facebook or even our website with the link below. Again, thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to an incredible week here at the Pentecostals of Boulder City. Hope you have a fantastic week and we love you and God bless you and your family.